It was just a completely different mindset from the police department. Uh, police department, you know, you see your zone partners uh, on calls and you see everybody in roll call and that's pretty much it. And that was a John Severe fire. Uh, I was still on the police department. I was on duty that day, um, platoon three, and we were working the 412. So, um, I had my wife with me at the time riding, and we just stopped in the station two. It's five something, I guess. Uh, and they were just taking food off the stove, you know, setting it down on the table, and the tone came in. And I said, well, we won't be going long, you know, because John Severe usually wasn't a problem. Uh, however, they did have a fire death about two months before. Uh, with a guy trying to put kerosene into a, or a gasoline into a kerosene heater. But I said, hey, we'll be back. So we head out, go down the University Parkway and get to the intersection where McDonald's is on the state of Franklin. And you can see the black smoke already. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. So got around the front where we were supposed to go, where engine two was gonna be, and passed the fire floor, the, the the brute department, which was on the first floor, which surprised me in the fact that you could see that much smoke up already. Um, but it just, and you know, it just escalated from there. So that was, that was a long night. So what did you take away from that night? Is there anything that, that sticks out that you took away from your experiences that night? I mean, that was probably the reason the biggest reason I came over to the fire department, I felt like I could do more or better uh, for the people than I could at the police department. Because the police department, whatever case you took into court was usually a one dollar fine and court cost, and it just didn't seem like you were doing anything. So um, after that night, I thought, well, I'm going to challenge firefighter three, which was journeyman firefighter. I said, if I pass that, then I'll put in to go down. And, uh, and I did, so um, I, I think the takeaway is from years later, you know, there was no instant command system down there. It was uh, free for all, people running around. Um, and I'll have to say probably the best organized uh, was EMS at that time because they had ambulances from all over and they staged them, uh, backed in and had the, the doors open and ready to go so that when they brought victims, they were gone, you know. So uh, they were probably the most organized. But we had volunteers from everywhere uh, here. And, you know, it was just kind of a do this, do that. There was no really organizational. Um, so I think that's the biggest takeaway is how far we've come now from where we were then. Well, we got some bagger with me. Come on say, in, Rick Arnold. May want to say a few things. <laughs> I heard him. I heard him earlier. Heard what? I heard you. <laughs> How you doing, bro? I'm good. Are you? Good. <laughs> Let's get this Dean Martin roast over with. <laughs> well, no. More like Jerry Love. <laughs> <laughs> when did you first meet Mr. Harrison? Gee whiz. <laughs> we had to get one of those. Long, long time ago. <laughs> right. In the 90s, I guess, when you came down one. Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you were on another ship that uh, got to know each other. And then when we came on the same ship, got to be good friends. <clears throat> and so, I know you want somebody to come and say good things about him. And absolutely. Talk about his good character. <laughs> this is the one you can find. All the <laughs> Well, you yeah, know, we I, had to dig deep. Okay. I've not really told a lie since I left the fire department. Oh, okay, yeah. well, that's a good thing. <laughs> Number one. That's a good thing. So what are some memorable <laughs> memories you have of him working with him? I mean, what are some of the memorable stories that you can tell, you know, that are maybe not well, too bad? Most of them I can't tell. Yeah. They would incriminate me, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah we, did, we didn't get to see some of the funnier things that we do, like driving to the wrong scene or because he would drive one the ladder truck or 
the engine and then vice versa for a month or two. And so we didn't get to see some of those things that you don't tell about some of the big blunders that you make. You have to be riding with them to see those, but we sure saw some funny things around the station. Uh, we, uh, we really enjoyed passing the time by having fun at somebody else's expense. Uh, some of the firemen, the police officers that come and spend their time. I, one of them we, we tormented. Uh, it, if they, we liked them and they were easy to get along with, you really gave them a hard time. But one of the funniest things I saw, he, he carried a great big duffel bag. It was huge. And they'd give him a hard time over it. And he went back there one morning to go home and they'd put the portable TV in the duffel bag and when he dragged off the bed, it about put him in the floor. But uh, Dave, uh, most people don't know this, but Dave could be a little hot-headed. He had a little bit of a temper. Most people didn't see that. Just over faucets. <laughs> most people didn't see that. But uh, Dave wasn't, he never was me. We were close friends, and I guess he felt sorry for me, so he never got mean with me. But I, I saw him get grouchy a time or two. I won't say grouchy, but did you see the sergeant major and we were soldiers? Yeah. Yeah. One liners. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I couldn't see. He's such a likable guy. I couldn't ever see that side of him. You know, did, did some really funny things. We had a guy named uh, J Lo, we called him. And if he saw a nickel laying on the side of the road, he wanted you to pull the engine over and let him get that nickel. And there at Station 5, the concrete had some cracks in it about a half inch wide between sections and five inches deep or so. And somebody dropped a quarter and it went down in there and he saw it. Honestly, he worked for an hour with a pocket knife. You'd get it to the top and then it'd fall back. And that happened over and over for about an hour. And finally, he, he gets it up, he gets it on the ledge, and he said, Look, look, Dave, I got it. And Dave walks over, takes the toe of his boot, and pushes it back in there and says, Let's see you do it again. So, uh, there was always something uh, funny, or it, uh, you kind of look forward to going to work. That was some of the most enjoyable time during my career was when we worked together at five. We yeah. we had some good times. Uh, Absolutely. But uh, going back to Dave Temper, he was having a rough day. We had some rough days back then. There were some stressful things with administration and other things, but we were going to wash the trucks and Dave had the hose and you know how you'll pull the garden hose and it'll catch on the back of a tire or something and it stuck. And, he jerked it and it just wedged it tighter and so he walks back and he's mad and he jerks that hose loose and it's like that garden hose had a mind of its own. It kind of wrapped around his legs and the harder he kicked it, the worse it got. It just like, he couldn't get away from it. And he and was- Chevy Chase came out. <laughs> he was throwing a fit. <laughs> we, we were standing there and me and Jason Lowe and we looked at each other and we kind of put our heads down trying to grin and not get caught. And, Boy, was he mad. And then Jason made some kind of comment about the uh, scene from Christmas Vacation with Clark Griswold. So then for a little while, it was uh, everything that happened, we'd call him Clark. But uh, no, what I- What it's not telling you is I jerked the dang faucet out of the wall. We had to <laughs> yeah. spend that night putting another line in a brick wall with it. So I don't know how you do that. I don't know how I did that either. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. but I tell you about Dave, uh, Dave was one of those that, that he was so good at technology and uh, the new things and most of us weren't. We were basically simple minded but uh, you'd almost be jealous of him if he wasn't such a great guy but he, we depended on him to help us keep up but Dave was always one to stay on top of the game and would uh, have the latest gadgets for lack of a better word but uh, I always like things that made me look good <laughs> you know, like I knew what I was doing so, well, I think you did brother I think you that's did. what it took <laughs> yeah man it's like electronics I do remember that and being around you it's always the, the latest and great like iPhones and stuff like that it was always the yeah. cutting edge technology and if you didn't know you asked Harrison we all looked at flip phones yeah I, I thought I was something when I got a Blackberry and Little did I know it'd been out of date 10 years prior. <laughs> it was a hand-me-down, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't on top of that game, but uh, he always had to, 
do his things and he had the uh, ability to use them. Everything except his carpentry tools. He wasn't much of a handyman, but no, <laughs> still not. You tried. <laughs> not really. Put forth the effort anyway, right? Yeah. That's kind of thing. <laughs> so, but yeah, I, I mean, is there anything he sticks out like in your time working with him that just sticks out? I mean, anything that you can take away from your experiences in, in being around Dave? Was he a positive influence or, or even a negative influence? Well, he's like a brother. Yeah. We, we were like brothers. I was like his little brother. That's just inside. I was going to say. <laughs> My needs. Because we've always, we've always heard him you know, talking about uh, on the fire station about how you two together were really a formidable team. Kind of like Batman and Robin, if you will. Well, we, we learned real quick we didn't even have to rehearse it. We could uh, kind of get under somebody's skin and mess with them. We're actually still being blamed for stuff. I don't know if you've heard this, but they, they gave all those uh, buttons down to John Sevier Center from the call buttons, and they swore that we did that, so we keep them up at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, they run so many calls down there now. I wish I'd thought of it. <laughs> That'd be great. <laughs> but it, uh, yeah, it was for some reason, I don't know, I guess some of the guys we messed with so much kind of labeled us that way, but uh, I thought we were pretty nice guys. We're harmless. Yeah. I don't know where that came from. Nothing like the guys we came in to work with. Yeah, yeah, because yeah, there's several of them that, yeah, that I'll agree they're a different level. My wife thought because Dave and I were such good friends that we were the same age. I mean, I'm, I don't know, nine years, ten, mm -hmm. older, but, but we were such good friends. She just assumed we were the same age. She came out to eat lunch with us one day, and we were having a birthday party for Dave, and had the cake set there, and some candles on it, and. Uh, she said, oh, who's birthday? She said, Dave. And she said, well, how old are you, Dave? He said, 39. She said, yeah, all right. How old are you? <laughs> he really was 39. It was his birthday. He, look, he looks so funny. <laughs> but it uh, wasn't, the, uh, wasn't the appearance. It was just the... <laughs> well, that's the thing, I guess, is that the average person doesn't understand probably how close you get when you have to work 24 hours with somebody. Yeah. You know, is there anything peculiar things that they well, did at his time that was just like a habit that you noticed or something that you developed as something to see what he did to you? Or? Well, he had the good habits of uh, studying and preparing and <laughs> those things, and we were uh, more about the uh, just uh, have a good time today. But Dave was a lot more disciplined than the rest of us. I think probably his military time had a lot to do with that. Uh, but yeah, we learned a lot from Dave, no doubt about it. Uh, I'll never forget, he, he had kind of a mischievous side, but he was, I don't remember if he was a captain or, or as a acting operation chief or what it was, but we had a fire one night and one of the higher ranking officers showed up and started asking questions and basically kind of buddy. And, Dave looks at him and gave him an assignment that you'd give a rookie firefighter, go over there and stand at the back of that building and watch what's going on. Yeah, I need a safety officer on seaside. He sent him to the other side of the building. He went and just stood there and did what he was told, but I thought that... And he just gave that little grin, like... <laughs> but uh, uh, it, there's certain people that just connect, and you do almost feel like, somehow you're related, but that's the way Dave and I have always been from the start. It's hard to find bad stories about Dave, I'll be honest with you. Uh, we have the funny ones, but uh, you, you can't find anything bad to say about Dave. Uh, and he was a good example for us, to the rest of us, that kind of wanted to move up, but just didn't want to put the effort into it to do it. But he kind of showed you you're not going to do it and you don't put out the effort. I guess that's why I never moved past lieutenant. But. <laughs> you didn't want to. <laughs> I didn't want to. No. <laughs> but uh, uh, it, uh, I'm glad Dave is retiring. I mean, I've been gone five years in June. But just like you said a minute ago, you leave and you have good intentions, but you, you just don't come back because you're busy. Even though you're retired, you're busy and you're uh, enjoying freedom. Well, I think it's different too. Once you go out that door, you're not in the fight. You're not really, no matter how long you've been here, you're not part. Even though they say you are, you're not. 
you know, it's a different building. So I think your time here has been special with the fire department. Yeah. I mean, you got to look, it's like with John Severe, and then of course, you know, 9-11, we didn't even talk about that. It's something we kind of left out, but you know, the 9-11, because there's not a lot of us that were working here. Yeah. It's 2022, there's not a lot of them that are working here. They were working during 9-11. Yeah, we there's were, people. We were at Station 5. Yeah, yeah. No, tell me about 9-11. Well, first you go back to the Oklahoma City bombing. I was on duty that day too. So, you know, it seems like every time something big came on, we were working. But 9-11 uh, was, we were working on tearing the windows out of Station 5 and putting yeah. new windows out. them all out. And, uh, you know, all this just came about. So uh, you're trying to work and do what you need to do and still kind of watch what's going on. So it, it was just different. You know, I actually look up in the sky at night and not see any airplanes flying. You know, it, was, it just changed our world. And then um, when we started the, the bombings and all that, stuff for retaliation and you know it just it just changed the way we did everything i mean because it's just like even the day-to-day -day stuff is you know it's like do you remember the policy about anthrax or you know after 9 11 everyone anytime anyone would drop sheetrock in the road it was a white powder yeah. and everything now, do you remember that anthrax policy we had about what we did with it it always stuck out to me that was kind of crazy was we were to gather the substance double bag it and then throw it in the drill tower, in the drum. Yeah. That was the way we dealt with a suspicious white powder. And look how far we've came today. Well, I was going to say, you know, but that's, that was the first. That was just like um, yeah. with the John Severe not having instant command. You know, once we started get, doing the instant command, we did on everything. We did dumpsters, car fires, and now it's it's second nature. Nobody thinks anything about it. Um, you know, the EMT program, when we first started doing that, you know, the, the old guys called us Dr. Rod when we came in because we had an EMT patch on. Now, that's 80% of the business, you know, so uh, it's just, a, it's a generational thing, but it's also a, a fire service driven thing uh, that, that changes your world. And the 9-11 certainly changed everybody's world. We didn't have Department of Homeland Security before that. You know, we didn't have grants to buy things that we didn't know we needed at the time, which we didn't really need at the time. So it's just like COVID will probably change the way the fire service operates from now on. And who knows what will be next. I hope that I've done something positive to affect, I mean, it's a completely different fire service than when I came here. Um, the gear's different. You know, we had the old steel bottles on SCBA. Uh, when I first started, we didn't even have bunker pants. We had the three quarter hip boots you pulled up. They don't use the horses and wagons anymore? No more. You know, the burning bush was the last time I fought a forest fire. So, uh, <laughs> you see why we brought him along? I mean, he stepped right in. That's, that's great. Yeah, he is. He's good at that. <laughs>